if you look at COVID-19, it has kind of disrupted uh, our way of life, you know. And as a tech journalist, uh, one thing that I miss a lot is all those tech events that we used to go to, not only to listen to, to uh, technologies, uh, to do interviews and panels, but also the hallway track where we'll kind of, you know, hang out. And that's where the actual, you know, stories that happen, you know, all the buzz that you hear, get. Uh, but what I feel is that video has kind of become a great alternative to physical events. Of course, you will not have that physical interaction, but still, you it brings an experience closer to that. And today we have with us uh, Elvin Richards, as Chief Product Officer at Reddit Lab. And you guys just organized your first ever virtual event because of this crisis. So I'm kind of curious, what kind of experience was that? It was amazing. I mean, first of all, I think our marketing team did the most amazing job in five weeks going from a physical conference to a virtual conference. Um, and so I think it was it was a really great experience because it, it was very inclusive. It didn't make it so you were location dependent. And so we had about eight and a half thousand people register. We had a little over close to four thousand people attend. Uh, there was like four and a half thousand hours worth of content that was consumed by the audience. And the fact that I love most of all was there were 15,000 virtual games of ping pong played by the attendees. So we created this virtual world whereby you could walk around with your avatar, you could talk to people, you could attend sessions, you could play ping pong. Um, it was a bit like sort of Second Life, uh, if you remember Second Life. Uh, I'm sure my kids would describe it as, you know, with with a latest multiplayer game, but it, it gave that sort of environment where you could see people and collaborate. It's not quite chatting over the water cooler or bumping people into the into the hallway, but at the same time, we tried to create something that was highly rich and highly interactive. And uh, I think it was an amazing experience. And when you think about it, it took five weeks to put it together. It was a it's really quite awesome job. Yeah, and only thing that I also missed was, you know, after a long day when you hit the bars with all your friends and colleagues and you just hang out there. <laughs> well, I'm, so. I'm sure people brought their beverage of choice with them to the event. <laughs> yeah, bring your old drink, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, so event is over. Uh, what are some of the major highlights, major announcements that were made during the event? Yeah, there, there are a lot of things we talked about. Um, one of the big things is that uh, uh, Redis 6 has been launched as the open source project version, and there's a whole bunch of features in there we can talk about. We also have got Redis Enterprise 6 that piggybacks with that. There was a, a, a big announcement with a partnership with Microsoft on the Azure platform, and a whole host of other features like Redis AI and Redis Gears, a way of, we're extending the way that Redis can be used to accommodate more and more use cases and more uh, database-like uh, workloads. Let's talk about Redis 6 open source. Uh, we'll talk a bit about you know highlights, features, what's new there. So let's start with open source Redis 6. So one of the major features was access control lists. So this is the ability to constrain the operations you can perform against certain keys by particular users. And this is a, um, a key feature that's been asked for many years in order to actually provide some separation of concerns from what an application or a service needs versus what an um, operator needs. And so that's a really major feature. Now, in Enterprise 6, we've extended ACLs to include role-based access control. And that just simplifies the administration because you can define a role once with all the permissions and then assign that to users. So also in open source, there is a whole bunch of other refactoring work that went on. So there's multi-threaded IO. We changed the way the eviction policy works. So as your time to live expires, we do that much more efficiently. There's a new protocol for the client to communicate to the server, which now enables the client to do client-side caching and get that uh, client-side cache expired uh, from the server. So there's a whole host of really great features that went into open source. As I said, enterprise builds on top of open source. Um, Role-based access control was a, a critical thing, but we've also extended out functionality like Active uh, Active, which is geo replication. And now that supports one of the major um, data types in Redis, which is streams. So that allows you to do stream processing 
in different data centers, but have a consistent view of how that data is being processed. So there's some really great sort of core features that have gone into uh, that baseline product. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, go back to the event piece, uh, other announcement. One of the major announcements was also your partnership with Microsoft. Tell us a bit about the partnership itself and what does it mean for developers, for Redis users and for Microsoft users? We're, we're super excited. We've been working over a year hand in hand with the Microsoft Azure engineering team. And essentially what we announced this week was uh, a new tier in the Azure cache um, uh, service. So right now there's three tiers that Microsoft provide. They're gonna add in two additional tiers so that you'll be able to get the benefits of Redis Enterprise, but have that same um, experience that you're used to from a Azure perspective. So essentially what's happening is there's a direct integration into the Azure console. So the way that you procure, the way you integrate, the way you launch the service is just like any other Azure service. So it looks like a sort of first party service. Uh, underneath you get all the benefits of Redis Enterprise. So that's uh, features like some of the modules that we will support in Azure. So things like time series, search, bloom. Uh, it is features like Redis on Flash. So you can tier your data between DRAM and SSD. So you can uh, store much larger data sets at a better uh, total cost of ownership. Um, it also means that you've got things like um, active active geo replication as well so that you can have multiple clusters in Azure where they, um, you're getting a consistent state of the data between those clusters. So really what it, what it means to the developer is that you've got the same way of accessing uh, Redis. It's the same sort of endpoint, the same provisioning process, but you get all of these sort of scalability and cost savings as your usage uh, increases, but you've also got access to these additional data types that allows you to uh, use Redis for other use cases. And uh, I mean, since uh, Microsoft does a lot of open source, Redis does a lot of open source, and today, you know, when you are uh, running your virtual in the cloud, you just mix and match, so people can already do a lot of things. So what exactly, or what additional, uh, benefit that users will be getting uh, from this, you know, uh, cache service or, or this partnership that they were not getting earlier? The, the benefits is uh, it really comes down to um, what use cases can you now use Redis for? So for the developer with these additional data structures, it just extends the type of things that you can use Redis for. So you want to model time series data, you can do that within Redis rather than trying to stitch together multiple services. So you, the developer gets that immediate benefit. Uh, in terms of the organization uh, and the operator, you get the benefits of very simple scaling, but very cost effective scaling. And so this allows people to store larger and larger data sets in memory um, and then get all the benefits of low latency and the ability to deal with uh, high velocity and high change rates. And so it, it sort of tips that equation of, um, rather than having Redis as an intermediate store, having Redis as the store for everything, uh, because you could do this in a cost-effective way, but retain all the benefits of that you used to with Redis. Initially, you also mentioned uh, Redis AI and Redis Gear. Talk about those two things and uh, what are they all about? Yeah, so there's a couple of the big things that we announced the general availability of. So um, they're sort of connected, but they serve you know different parts of, uh, of the ecosystem. So Redis AI is um, a way to do um, uh, model serving through Redis. And so you get all the benefits of the ability to do that inferencing within Redis running that code inside the process rather than running it externally and uh, having to do the tra data transfer. So that means that you get um, much improved import performance four to 10x over the common frameworks for that model serving. So that's really quite critical when you've, you, you've got an SLA or a performance characteristic around the need to serve those models. Gears is something that's slightly different. So Gears is essentially infinite programmability. Um, what it allows you to do is drop in a piece of Python code or a piece of C code 
into the Redis server. So it acts as like a serverless execution engine. And then that means that that, that code that you've written runs as close to the data as possible. Now, the Gears framework extracts you away from the knowledge of what the topology of the cluster looks like. So you can write your code assuming that you've got a sort of global view of the data and the processing framework does all the work to actually distribute the work across the cluster, pull those results back together. So you could think of it as sort of, you know, um, a, a MapReduce framework built in in order to actually deal with all of that, um, that complexity. And so again, this allows you to do um, processing much closer to the data and get all the benefits of this, the speed and the low latency. And who are you targeting with these Redis AI and Redis Gears? Uh, two, two, but sort of similar parts of the market. So, um, you know, if you think about the, the, the sort of story of Redis, you know, you know, it first started as a, as a cache, then um, it became a database platform as persistence and reliability and all those things were put in. Now it's sort of morphing into a sort of cognitive platform uh, for that AI processing. And again, you know, what Gears will allow you to do is, is combine the processing for all these different types of frameworks. So. You, you can imagine you, you may want to do some inferencing with AI or you may want to do a graph search or you may want to start off with a full text search, but then those uh, pipeline or move into um, uh, processing or using the other data structures. So you can actually combine multiple data structures in order to uh, create an answer and serve up that data to that answer. Uh, if we are in the mid of 2020, I don't even know where we are in 2020 because of this virus thing going on. You know, and it so, seems like one very, very long day. <laughs> exactly. Uh, at the same time, it's also really hard to say anything about the future, you know, what the world will look like because we just don't know. But uh, if you look at these, this event and this announcement, what does the what kind of roadmap you have for Redis, at least for a year, if, you can, if you're brave enough to talk about that? and how these announcements, Microsoft Partnership, Redis 6, Redis AI, and Redis Gear fit into that roadmap? Uh, that's a really good question. So I think there's a lot of themes going on here. I think one of the theme is um, making Redis as secure and as easy to deploy anywhere. So this is the sort of the ACL features and we're extending that to uh, include things like external identity providers so you can configure RBAC from LDAP or AD, right? So this is just a way for uh, larger organizations to consume Redis more easily because it fits into some of their standard practices. If you think about the Azure announcement, this is all about um, get Redis where you want it, but with the features that you need in order to satisfy the business needs. And so Azure is just uh, a great example of that. And last year we, we did um, a, a big announcement with Google. So this is just us extending the ubiquity of how you can get a Redis enterprise. And so uh, that's really important. And then, you know, in terms of, you know, the march towards a cognitive platform, that's all about uh, being uh, access to the right data structures, the right processing, um, the right frameworks so that you can actually serve this data um, with the right SLAs to those services or end users so that you can actually create the processing of the data at volume and at speed so that you can actually start answering those, those problems that were you, you were kind of doing batch processing in the past, you can actually now start doing this in real time. Alvin, thank you so much for, for talking to us today, not only about the event and the experience, a great experience. We, I think we should figure out a way to, <laughs> for for bring your own beer or bring your own drink. But other than that, I think we are doing good with all these you know, virtual events. And at TFI also, you know, we are kind of trying to help, you know, to, to kind of uh, leverage our audience and talk more about whatever is going on and all those announcements that you mentioned. And I look forward to talk to you again at some point. Thank you once again. Great to see you as well.